Well, good morning and thank you all for, for coming here. I want to really thank the uh, Institute for, for Advanced Studies, uh, directed by uh, Professor Mir Mirdal. Uh, maybe some of you don't know, but this is a real sanctuary where you can, in Paris, you know, think. That's a rare op opportunity. Today, it is spring in, in, in Paris, you know, the best time of year. I think the sky has become a, a bit grim, probably in anticipation of our topic. But um, I think I actually am pri primarily a neurosurgeon and occasionally have an opportunity to ask some, some, some questions, to make some uh, observation in unique situation. So I am really, as I said probably last year, I'm completely out of my uh, comfort zone. I'm on, on a limb of a, of a tree and I'm going further and further. And we all hope that the limb doesn't break. But the same is for, for you all. This is sort of an unusual meeting. We, we are the discussing something that is uh, far from being established. And we're all gonna <coughs> essentially get out of our com comfort zone and try to, to really think about it. Uh, initially, we tried to create a bridge to, to the social sciences. In the first time that I pre presented it, I was, to use a delicate word, massacred, really, by the social scientists who felt that I was just a casual reductionist who was really bothering them. But then I think we, we eventually created some, some kind of a di dialogue. Uh, I also want to, of course, uh, thank very much my esteemed colleague, uh, Professor Brett Rose, who initially invited me to the Collège de, de France, and the plot con continued from then on. So let's uh, get to our topic uh, today, the brains that pull the trigger. Um, you know, though, those quotes from, from the people who, who have been uh, at, at the Bat Bataclan last year, essentially, uh, to some extent, express the horror of meeting somebody like us, to use the term maybe one of us, who looks completely ordinary, and then with absolute calm, almost in a random fashion, uh, exert uh, this extreme uh, vi violence. So uh, what I will do and try to, to do is briefly, because uh, I have done it last, last year, but essentially to bring every, everybody to, to the same uh, common denominator, I'll try to briefly re review the uh, basics of, of, of the de de definition and the initial uh, ob observations, uh, and then maybe move on to, to the challenges that we will face uh, in this conference. Initially, uh, it was interesting that in 1996, uh, The Lancet uh, had, had this uh, a edit editorial, which they called Pandora and the Problem of Evil. And they pointed out that uh, it was a year, they summarized the year, so a year of great achievement, but we're still dealing with this unexplained uh, f phenomena of uh, extreme uh, vi violence and, and there's really no grant money to look at this, and nobody's going to look at this probably because it's very difficult to uh, to study. They kind of threw it as a, a challenge, and I was starting to uh, think about it. Of course, you know, seeing the pictures, one cannot avoid seeing this repetitive, uh, repetitive occurrence, uh, which ec most extremely is expressed, you know, in Poland in 1941 and during those terrible years. Uh, in Cam Cambodia in 1975, in uh, Srebrenica in 1995, in uh, Rwanda in 1994, uh, in Syria in 2014. So there is a common denominator intuitively when we look at this. But his historically, I think the uh, somebody who expressed it rather clearly was Saul Fried Friedlander, who studied the uh, Holocaust and World War II. 
And he basically was discussing the unease of historical interpretation. And he said, most interpreters try to avoid the problem posed by the psychology of total extermination by concentrating exclusively on specific ideological motives or institutional dynamics. But an independent psychological residue seems to defy the historian. Psychological dimension, whenever recognized, is usually reduced to a vague reference here to Arendt, the banality of evil. The unease of interpretation, he said, cannot but stem from the non-congruence between intellectual probing and the blocking of intuitive comp comprehension. And essentially uh, invoked you know, Freud uh, term of, of, of the Unheimlichkeit or the uncanny sensation when there is really intellectual uncertainty of distinction between an animate and non-animate object. And we cannot but admit, on the one hand, the human ordinariness of the perpetrators, and notice, on the other hand, the mechanical, non-human aspect of their actions. We are dealing with human beings of the most ordinary kind approaching the state of automata. Our sense of uncanny, essentially, is indeed triggered by this deep uncertainty as to the true nature of the perpetrator. And I think it's sort of a, an, an interesting way to look at it. And just to give, a, and I, I won't go over it in detail as I have done last year, but in the background of all this were the social uh, scientists, uh, sciences and, uh, of course, the Milgram ex experiment which uh, put forward the, the uh, obedience to, to, to orders. And I think this conference will hear from Patrick Haggard, you know, a modern version of that, which I think would be very in interesting to compare to the original uh, ex experiment and see whether this can be really uh, pushed forward into, into the neuroscience you know, of the 21st century. But I'll leave it to Patrick uh, who will discuss this issue of obedience and, of course, the issue of res responsibility. And the second, you know, more popularized, or the same popularized, was the Stanford Prison Experiment. I won't go into details, but this is essentially people who are randomly divided to guards and prisoners in a setting which was criticized, I must say, uh, have indeed, over a short period of time, uh, guards have started to, to exhibit uh, some some traits of uh, callousness, of uh, cruelty, of uh, ab abuse uh, of the uh, inmates. And of course, that has been uh, recently uh, popularized again by Zim Zimbardo with respect to, to the Abu Garib uh, you know, uh, situation. Uh, but that did, um, did bother uh, especially in the sense that there were most, most guards or most people assigned to this role essentially went along with, with this. But of course the seminal, uh, and, and then of course the concept of the banality of evil which Arendt introduced, and talking about Eichmann lacking really intention in the legal sense insofar that he was not thinking. Uh, does does court need to prove he intended to commit genocide? She didn't think he acted without conscious activity, but thought that thinking should be re reserved for more reflective case of rationality. Now the whole thing, of course, came under severe criticism, and perhaps the banality of it is is not so much fitting Eichmann himself, which was far from from, from being a banal per person but maybe for, for the perpetrators in general who actually faced uh, with the uh, chore of carrying out the extermination. But the real uh, turning, I think, a very important doc document uh, of Christopher Browning, who was with us last, last year here, uh, is a book, Ordinary Men, which came in 1992, and we discussed this in great detail last last year, but just briefly, these were, uh, as many of you know, reserve police, uh, but battalion 101, uh, 500 men, 30 to 50 middle-aged policemen, businessmen, construction workers, 
they shot f uh, about 40,000 Jews, men, women, and children over a short period of time and transported 40,000 to Tre Treblinka. And, and what, uh, what Browning uh, really uh, found out that 80% of people really opted to participate. There was no punishment for not participating. No one got executed for, for that or got in, in, into prison. There was no battle frenzies. People you know, were not like fanatics, you know, Nazi fanatics or whatever. They barely were you know, party members. But there was a certain pattern there of sparing no one and hunting down everybody and there were certain uh, symptoms of this phenomena. Uh, and he posed the real question, why did most men in Reserve Police Battalion 101 become killers, while only a minority of perhaps 10%, and certainly no more than 20, did not? And this was again the numbers that came up in the Stanford Prison Experiment and then a really good book that I actually have not uh, looked into care carefully last, last year and was pointed out to, to, to me by, uh, by uh, Semlin. It was really uh, the in saison de, de machettes, which is absolutely, um, it's a very rare doc document because uh, he was able uh, under some circumstances to inter interview a group of per per perpetrators. And as much as it can be criticized as one group of uh, a small group, the insights that I will quote to you this time are quite, uh, quite uh, dr dramatic in nature. But those of you who don't know, of course, it was a low-tech mass slaughter perpetrated by tens of thousands of ordinary men, one of the unique features of the Rwandan genocide. But it's mentioned of tens, if not hundreds of thousands, of mostly peasants, many of them illiterate, most of whom had never killed before, most of whom had no record of criminal activity, who were somehow mobilized. And no, again, no example have surfaced of someone arrested simply for refusing to kill. That's, that's what, what comes up. So this is really the situation that we are facing. You know, where millions of people are suffering, but it comes down to this unfortunate and terrible scene uh, of this uh, soldier, essentially, calm, calmly or very simply pointing a gun to, uh, at, at that woman and somebody even photographing it, probably to send back to his wife in Germany. There are evidence of that. So, uh, I said there, there are some features which appear to me quite consistent throughout those this, this, this description. And uh, because I came from a medical field, and because a challenge was posed by a medical journal, I thought that maybe one way to really steer a discussion on that is to use the medical model of something that we do not understand. And in medicine, something we do not understand we approach very primitively. We first of all define the, obser the observation, the clinical observation, you know, symptoms, signs. That's what we try and describe before even we have an exp explanation and see whether there is some reg reg regularity in it. So there I said, especially the transformation of groups of previously nonviolent individuals into repetitive killers of defenseless members of society has been a recurring phenomenon throughout history. And this transformation is characterized by a set of symptoms and signs that I attempted at that time, just from a descriptive sense, to dis describe. And send it as the hypothesis to the Lancet. I will not burden you with the uh, very extensive negotiations with the Lancet at the editorial board. And the editorial board was essentially split I said, what the hell is this? And eventually, it came down to a uh, to decision to actually publish it. And so let's look at the, at the symptoms, just to bring it, all of us to, 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 to a common denominator. First is repetitive and escalating acts of violence. The individual engages in stereotypic repetition of extreme violence characterized by impulsion to spare none of the victims. 
And you can see here uh, one of the perpetrators, they all quote from perpetrators. Right? The only regulation was to keep going till the end, maintain a satisfactory pace, spare no one. Okay? Everyone was hired at the same level for a single job to crush all the cockroaches. That was a quote from, from, from one of the perpetrators. So the second is really that there is some ideological framework to the ph phenomena, what I call obsessive ideation. Individuals are obsessed with a set of beliefs often uh, directed against a minority group. And of course, in the Armenian, it was the Young Turks I ideology, Muslim and Turk su supremacy. In the Holocaust, it's a virulent anti-Semitism and racial I ideology. In Cambodia, it was utopia, ideology of ideal Cambodian society establishing the peasant as a key to the organization of production. In, fa in fact, all the Khmer Rouge founders were students in Paris and members of a Stalinist French Communist Party. These were really uh, people who really studied and, and, and were, were active intellectually. Rwanda, the Hutu power, many key players were scholars, intellectuals who produced an elaborate racial ideology with roots in the Belgian colonial era. ISIS, the laws of Sharia, as they see it. All Kurds are heretics, and the Christians are heretics, and we must kill them all. This is, this is the ideology which is behind it, which I'll talk in more detail. Third is really perseveration. There is a stereotype behavior which perseverates in face of changing circumstances. There is a failure to adapt to changing stimulus reinforcement association. And I think the most, uh, you know, the most extreme example is the, the death marches at the end of World War II. The war was lost. It was clear. Everybody knew that. Still, there was a continuation of destruction <coughs> in the face of losing the war, okay? And the, the uh, Hut Hutus, which were finally de defeated and fled to Congress, to Hungary, but kept hunting in the ruined houses for forgotten Tutsis, yes? And the 101, you know, they just went through the forest and it was a big deal if they found one Jew which was hiding in one little hole, okay? So they spare no one. I mean, what is the logic behind it? It is not a trivial obs observation, but it's a repetitive observation. The four is really diminish affective reactivity. It is not the drunk Cossacks, you know, who are running a pogrom and just, you know, out of enthusiasm and, you know, drunk or whatever, although we'll talk about the neuromodulation with drugs. They're usually not friends. In fact, there is some kind of flat affect which appears over and over again. Yeah, for instance, these are quotes from Cezanne de Machette that I'm bringing today we are in the saison de, de, de Machette. Last year we were in Ordinary Man. So he was coming down, all dresses, one of the victims, and scared. I gave him a machete blow at neck level on the vulnerable vein. It came to me without thinking. He fell without shouting, without moaning. I felt nothing. Just let him lie. Since I was killing, often I began to uh, feel it didn't mean anything to me. It gave me no pleasure. We became more and more cruel, more and more calm. Okay from one of us, and we have, you know, the, uh, the author here, Asna Seerstad, describing Breivik when he actually, he calmly went around to each one of the, these kids in turn and ended their lives with a shot to, to the head. I mean, the descriptions there are wrenching. I mean, the kids are begging for their, their lives, and, and he's, he's not like, he's not in a frenzy or anything. He's not in, he does very calm, calmly. Hyperarousal. Now, what is hyperarousal? That is what uh, I sort of got, uh, this is what called Rausch by, uh, by Friedlander. And really, I should, I'm indebted to him for raising it. He sort of described a sense of elation with a number and totality of destruction, which is felt by the individual. So it is not necessarily re reactivity, sort of a cerebral elation. The more we kill, the more greediness urge does on. It's a positive feedback loop. And of course, we have that chilling speech of uh, Himmler in, in Posen, which is a landmark sort of speech in, in studies of that period. And he essentially is talking to the 
SS uh, elite. Said most of you know what it means when 100 corpses are lying side by side, when 500 lie there, or 1,000, having borne that and nevertheless some exceptional human weakness aside, having remained decent, has hardened us. All in all, we may say that we have accomplished the most difficult task out of love for our people, and we have not sustained any damage to our inner self, our soul, and our character. This is the most glorious page in our history, one not written and which will still never be written. That's a, an amazing, you know, uh, a, 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 a amazing putting forward of values in this type of situation of repetitive killing. Yeah. Use this one? Oh, okay. That will be better. Okay. The next is really intact skills such as language, memory, and problem solving uh, skills. It's too loud. Okay. Thanks, thanks. And this is an important thing. These people were able to really plan very elaborate, you know, deceit uh, maneuvers to get the victims, you know, not to know where they're actually heading. So these this, uh, uh, skills are actually in, intact. And seven is rapid habituation and desensitization. Within a short period of time, most individuals undergo desensitization. And really, that's, you know, the, the first kill is always difficult. I see the machete, I struck a first blow. When I saw the blood bubble up, I jumped back a step, I closed my eyes, delivered the second blow. It was done. That later, when got used to, to killing without so much dodging around. This was only the first kill. And even you, when, uh, when, uh, when Arthur Sirsat is describing Breivik, uh, essentially from his, his own account, his body was fighting against it the first time. Yeah, his muscles were twitching. A hundred voices in his head were screaming, don't do it, don't do it. But then he shot the, the first one. From now on, everything would be easy. And then he essentially, he was suffused by a feeling of calm. His will has triumphed. But is that this quick desensitization is amazing in this situation. Compartmentalization. Individual conduct activities of seemingly conflicting cognitive states may lead normal family lives and engage in killing of, of families. Environmental dependency. Dependency on group support and obedience to authority then the tenth one is group contagion, group environment necessary for maintenance and propagation of the syndrome. Responses of individual serve as stimuli for other members. We'll have Lionel Nakash discuss his model of this type of group con contagion with uh, in, in interesting uh, uh, par parallels to, to ep ep epileptic seizures, which generally spread in a brain. And indeed, the, the spread of apocalyptic b belief in, in, in ISIS case has been amazing to some people. It's viral, con contagious, and spread swiftly through social networks. And I think today, one of the things which we, I, I would like us to think about and discuss is really how is the social milieu has really changed? How is the propagation of uh, I, I, ideas is really changing now? What is the meaning of a group? in this world, is that the same meaning that we have, people standing by each, each other. And apocalyptic be be believers are unwilling to abandon beliefs in face of contradictory evidence, more committed in the face of setbacks. That's from, from Berger, the, this description. Uh, and he has a book on, on, on ISIS. Now the social con contagious, the, the, uh, what's uh, interesting is the efficacy of social media in facilitating social contagion, ISIS being really expert in Twitter and, and the, the use of social media. As a temporal compressor burger did he describe, suddenly it seems like ISIS came out of nowhere. So this is a process which suddenly condensates very fast. And there is an, an immersion, group of strangers come together in circumstances where all normal existence ceases. And, and what he points out is there is really a high volume of social media together with what, what can be called remote intimacy. The concept of intimacy has really changed. It combined to create a dynamic in which immersion in apocalyptic time can, can, can occur. 
And I think the virtual space, for instance, the caliphate, is created by flow of content. From April 2014 to May the following year, official ISIS sources disseminated at least 250 pieces of original media, including text, photos, audios, and videos, all these supplemented by local op operators who add to, to this. So this is an escalating process that we have not been exposed to in the past. You know, as a medical diagnosis, I had to pr propose a differential diagnosis. Uh, this compared to the lonely serial killer, uh, a different psychopathology, killing in frenzy of war is different. And what is really the smallest unit of the syndrome? Is this two individual? Is this one individual who is in a virtual net? What is the meaning now of, of somebody like Breivik? Did he really act alone? or was he in, in a more expanded mil milieu? I think maybe we'll have a chance to hear about it. The risk factor at the time, which again in a medical model, gender male, age 15 to 50, 80% uh, penetrance really. The idea is that 80% or 70% of the population is susceptible to this type of transformation. At that time, of course, we were, we were still far away from the, from the uh, big uh, development in cognitive neuroscience and later with affective and social neuroscience. Uh, data was ab ab about models in, in general was, was still you know, at, at an early period. But what I uh, felt at the time and what I propose is the co is concept of cognitive fracture meaning we cease to generate emotions appropriate to images conjured by certain categories and stimuli. And the prefrontal cortex is functionally disconnected from lower centers, autonomic musculoskeletal and endocrine substrate of emotion. The amygdala essentially is shut down and that is the reason for, for the uh, low emotional reac reactivity. I get into it in more details you know, and how we can get into that and whether this is accurate. At that time, uh, there wasn't that much da data about the, the differentiation between orbitofrontal, ventromedial, dorsomedial, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal areas and how they can all fit in really to explain the constellation that exists here and which condensate quite quickly and, and causes really a transformation, almost a non-linear transformation. And then we are puzzled, something happened. I was at that time influenced by, so, by the so, somatic marker hypothesis of the, the Damasio, where complex decision making is aided by somatic marker, where visceral sign signals guide our behavior, and somato marker signals are generated in ventromedial part in fact, you know, they're also generated in the amygdala. He makes a distinction between primary and secondary. I can talk about it, but the idea was really the basic concept that I was struggling with. Indeed, that this really is not, there's really two models. The common, maybe <laughs> Freudian, McLean thinking, as we do have indeed a reptile primitive brain, visceral brain, which is all the time under the control of our neocortical mechanism, which developed so fast. And once they are really unleashed, then this kind of phenomena exist. This did not seem to me right, because obviously we don't see this in animal. Animals don't kill 500 animals. They kill an animal, and parasympathetically, they sit you know, under a tree and they rest, okay? And the disorder is really unique to humans and perhaps higher non-human primates, meaning it is not a disorder of a, a primitive brain being unleashed, but it is order of hyperactive neocortical systems which have developed in evolution, which are essentially disconnected or not in homeostasis with a natural visceral subcortical mechanisms which are under normal circumstances give us a lot in terms of decision making. So this is sort of the general thinking at the time. Now, when we come to the question of how are we gonna deal with it in terms of neuroscience, this kind of syndrome really affects perception, reasoning, 
memory, and we'll hear about that, emotions, decision-making, belief, concept, empathy, a concept of self and other, in, and group di dynamics, and responsibility. So all these things are affected. I mean, this, these are phenomenological observation. We see it, it is not trivial what is happening suddenly in this type of situation. So maybe we should go then and really think about uh, how those uh, systems are affected, of course, with the idea of having also several brains or many brains being in this type of uh, situation. So last year, uh, we discussed the, the issue of dehumanization, which I think we will continue and discuss in the first session today. To, today. And the dehumanized perception studied by uh, Fiske and, and Lazana Harris who talked last uh, year, is really a psychological means to really facilitate atrocities, torture, and genocide. This is really a change in perception. So we no longer, and this is, uh, you know, the guys with the machetes are telling us this, we no longer saw human being when we turned up a Tutsi in the swamps. I mean, a person like us sharing similar thoughts and feeling. Okay, talk about, uh, you know, theory of mind, okay? You get it in uh, Rwanda as if I had let another individual take on my own living appearance. The dehumanization is not only of the other, but also of the self to some extent. I fail to recognize the wickedness of the one who raced on my legs carrying my, my machete. They no longer were what they have been, and neither were we. Nothing bothered us, okay? And I just happened to start by killing, he said, several without seeing their faces. So the face is really, and he, this is a wonderful description. Really. Still, I do remember the first person who looked at me at the moment of the deadly blow. The eyes of someone you kill are immortal if they face you at the fatal instant. And from uh, Malraux, okay, what, 100 years ago, took, this is Chen, you know, in, in, in Chen in the first, uh, you know, first page or two of La, La Condition Humaine. When he's sitting there, there's a sleeping man, he has to, to kill him, and it's very difficult for him to do that. To kill him was nothing, he said. Touching him was impossible. Touching. So here, you know, so what the kind, the kind of study, and I think Jean was involved in this study, uh, you know, here what happened in the brain when, when people kill, and this, uh, we presented that the, the case where People are put in the fMRI, a video game. They see three kinds of situation. They, they look at objects, they look at civilians, they look at soldiers, okay? And then you, and, and then they are shooting at them in this video, uh, you know, virtual reality situation. And who did you shoot? Soldiers, civilians, nobody, okay? And this is a neural correlate of justified and unjustified killing. <laughs> justified, presumably, soldiers. And, you know, in, M in fMRI, you do everything minus, you know, A minus B, civilians minus soldiers. So, you know, they, what is very interesting to, to me is there was caused differences, as you can see in the lateral uh, orbitofrontal cortex, you can see on, on, on the right. But what is uh, quite interesting is the difference in the perceptual level in this inferior temporal uh, system, in, in the temporal occipital system which deals with perception, perception of faces, perception of objects. And this, this system was activated really in civilians, but was less activated when they were shooting at soldiers, which are probably dehumanized to some extent. So this is true to me even more, more telling than what is happening really at the frontal cortex. So the system which we to today have to turn our attention to is really the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, uh, which you, you, you can see here in, in purple and in, and in light blue. The ventral medial uh, prefrontal cortex, you can see in violet and pink there. The lateral prefrontal cortex, which you can see in red there. This is the lateral aspect. And of course, there are the striatum and the amygdala, which are all the, the structures, to some extent, the, the insula, which appear in, in many of the uh, studies which we have looked at. 
And you know, the, a, again, the somatic marker hypothesis has been, I think, very, very important because it proposes a mechanism by which emotional process can guide be behavior. And somatic markers are really association between reinforcing stimuli that in induce and associate affective physiological state. And they really guide the decision making. This, as I pointed out, and I, I don't have time to get in, into that, uh, are really the main structure are the ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the am amygdala. Uh, so that, for instance, a state like a snake, blood, a corpse, you know, would induce, you know, would induce a certain state. Uh, but when it stops to, to, to induce that, that's where our decision making and behavior can, can actually, uh, actually matter. And it's an interesting description uh, that he describes what one, one of the perpetrators. He said, in a stampede, an old man fell. He, I hacked him across the back with my Inkota sharp blade. I was quite surprised by the speed of death. Okay? And then he said, I, you, I, I never have dealt out death before. I used to pay a boy to kill the chickens behind the house and just avoid all that mess. So his somatic markers, you know, his, you know, that hypothesis prevented him from killing chickens. He gave somebody else to do this. He felt, you know, all the visceral uh, feelings probably attached with it. But yet, in 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 the syndrome E, which he was in, he was able to just hack with uh, machete people, left and right. What happened really? The second component which we will hear from, from, from Etienne Cochelain, is really the issue of rules and what happens when rules change. And there you, you will hear to, to more about the, the juxtaposition of the lateral uh, prefrontal cortex mediating rules and the medial uh, prefrontal cortex, the ventral medial and the orbitofrontal medial, which really mediate beliefs and values. And what happened? when those are juxtaposed one against the other. Presumably, the rules is the ideology, really, is what we really accept uh, and overrides, really, the values and be beliefs which we are accustomed to. The dorsal, uh, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex, uh, there is a, a few studies about that, uh, you know, studies which you know, quite original studies, which can be looked at in a critical fashion, but showing that it mediates social con conformity. I'll show you some data in, in, in a minute. And then a recent study which claims that it mediates adjustment in, in adherence to political and religious ide ideologies. Wait until I show you something in, uh, in a minute. And the whole issue of habits, how does behavior become aut automatic be behavior? Uh, unfortunately, Anne Gra Grable wasn't able to, to attend, although our in initial intent and her intent was to, to be here, to talk about how you know, the, the basal ganglia, controlled still by the infralimbic cortex, uh, is really uh, dealing with, with habits, such is, as in OCCD, in this recent paper in, in Brain, showing essentially imbalance in habitus versus goal-directed neural system during symptoms provocation in, in the magnet in obsessive compulsive dis, the disorder. So compulsion essentially are looked at as urges to perform stereotype behavior. Habit formation comes at the expense of goal-directed behavior. And the ventromedial prefrontal cortex connection with the basal ganglia, the lateral, specifically the putamen, are supposed to be dysfunctional in the sense that putem and hyperactivity underlying habitual compulsive behavior. So again, a model, and we have to consider to what extent there are parallels between OCD or some feature and the kind of repetitive behavior that I have dis de described in the syndrome and the process in an enhanced with stress, as some, pa some other papers show. So one of the things which we will be uh, attempting and, and perhaps just as, an, as a thought uh, exercise, with of course much ob ob objection, is the presence, uh, is a definition in terms of DSM-5. Here is how OCD is defined very clearly, defined by one, 
obsessions, meaning recurrent and persistent thoughts, urges, or impulses that are experienced at some time during the disturbance as intrusive and unwanted. That's probably not true you know, in the syndrome. Individual attempts to ignore or suppress such thoughts or to neutralize them. More convincing is perhaps the second feature, compulsion, which is repetitive behavior or mental acts that individual feels driven to perform in response to an obsession according to rules that must be applied rigidly, okay? The behavior of mental acts are aimed at preventing or reducing anxiety or distress. Again, this, this is in the def, 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 definition. And, and you know, there are other features, but you see how things are defined you know, very uh, rigidly uh, in this uh, manual now. But of course, when, when, when I pre pre presented, you know, the paper initially, the reaction to medicalization was terrible. Uh, I got this letter. The last time I saw the picture of Itzhak's first report, it was in the Holocaust Museum. He said, he said what, what is happening here to see the picture again in the Lancet above a caption indicating that the soldier was showing the signs of symptoms of syndrome E left me incredulous, okay? And you know, you continuously say to label such morally degenerate behavior with anodyne pseudoclinical labels such as syndrome E must represent the ultimate in our society trend to a denial of personal responsibility. Well, we had to swallow that and answer that, but but it does show you know, a, a le legitimate criticism, because our point was we're not relieving anyone of res responsibility. You know, having a shopping uh, you know, dis disorder or holding the, the, the disorder in DSM-5 doesn't relieve somebody from any res responsibility. It just catalogs the behavior and tries to, uh, to uh, establish signs and symptoms. And then another thing which we have to consider is psychopathy, which is also an ill-defined syndrome intermixed with antisocial personality disorder. Can characterizing psychopathy using DSM-5 personality trait, is there is a sharing you know, with, with uh, antisocial uh, personality dis disorder. But people describe diminished affective reactivity normal response to threat cues, but reduce responses to distress cue. And amygdala dysfunction postulated by Blair, weaker amygdala response to fearful faces, emotional words, moral violation, dilemmas of harmful acts, reduced mental medial prefrontal cortex response to morally salient stimuli. All this described in psychopathy, to what extent it really shares here. The next issue is, of course, the prevention and intervention issue. And this is, of course, people said, well, you know, it's wonderful to describe this, but, you know, what can we do about it? I mean, we're not going to go and, and, and uh, try to really in intervene with some, some, like this is full scale. What can we really do and offer as scientists? So clearly, if it is, it's effective only at early stages, as I said at the time. I said recognize the symptoms isolate affective individual and small groups. A syndrome cannot propagate without contact between individuals. This was my initial, uh, my initial thoughts. But since then, they have really developed to some extent uh, because uh, obviously there are ways to reduce con conflict and we, we, we will hear about it or means that we can take at early stages where we identify that the ground is fertile for such a syndrome to, to the develop. Maybe Emil can talk about it. Again, my uh, plea to you is, well, of course, present your data. I'm sure it's wonderful. But deal with the question. And what are the questions? We'll put them in immediately. And I think tomorrow we're going to have a talk by Robbins, uh, by Trevor Robbins, really, about the neuromodulation, the pharmacological neuromodulation. What is really justice is what the judge ate for breakfast. Is really a, a, a an extreme paper that was published in Proceeding of National Academy of Science by two is Israelis, by several Israeli scientists, which just looked at the uh, at rulings of uh, of judges, you know, based on their uh, food break, and they showed a, a very dramatically that the favorable rulings drops gradually 
from 65% to nearly zero within each decision session ending in a food break. It's pretty, pretty amazing, right? And you can think about all the dietary things which actually go into it. So the neuromodulator or drug is a, uh, which are associated with impaired serotonin function, associated with aggression, influence on moral judgment, acute tryptophan de depletion diet, here a diet, low serotonin brain tissue levels, increases likelihood of individual to punish someone who treated them unfairly, Crockett <coughs> studies, Aversion to harm may be associated with serotonin uptake inhibitors or, or opposite effects by uh, if you un antagonize it. And indeed, after I, uh, I uh, published the paper, uh, I got this letter from, from a, a colonel in the, I think he was a medical doctor who was employed in S Somalia. I said, you know, I watched a, a really curious tra transformation of Canadian peacekeeping forces who suddenly exhibited this incredibly cruel behavior, abusing, you know, Somalis, uh, and there was an incident of, of killing, eventually caused a big uproar in Canada. But what he said to me, you know, um, is it related to maybe to, to medication that they have uh, taken? And you see this, this case of, you know, for instance, mef mefloquine, which is an anti-malarian uh, drug. And here, early in the morning of March 11, army staff sergeant here left his remote out outpost in, in Kan Kandahar province, killed 16 people in two nearby vill villages, mostly women and children. Uh, he shot or stabbed them to, to death before dragging some of their bodies into a pile, you know. There was some thought that maybe he, he, he was taking this medicine. This leads to the whole issue of psychiatric side effect of uh, me mefloquine as an example, an application to f forensic psychiatry. So the effects on drugs in this type of situation cannot be unders underscored. And then the, uh, I, I will perhaps end with three uh, things. First is the idea of neuromodulation mod by stimulation, just essentially as a, uh, obviously it raises a lot of ethical issues, but the fact that this is possible by a transcranial magnetic stimulation to here in this case down regulate the posterior medial frontal cortex and reduce essentially social con 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 conformity. And I think the, and the most uh, uh, amazing <laughs> recent study actually from one of my, my colleagues at U UCLA was a collaboration with York, which was published by Hol Holbrook et al. It, first of all, they claim that uh, the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex mediates adjustment in adherence to political and religious ideology. And here they presented participant with the reminder of death, sort of, and a critique of the in-group ostensibly written by a member of an out-group. And then experimentally they decreased both avowed belief in God and out-group derogation by down-regulating the, the prefrontal, uh, medial frontal cortex, the, the, P, the pos posterior part, by transcranial magnetic stimulation. I mean, that study has to be read to really evaluate it, but, but uh, it, it does raise an, an issue, of course, and in this type of model, you know, the, where does the ideology come comes in? I mean, do we talk about medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior part, the, the uh, P, uh, uh, FMC? Or are we talking about the lateral, uh, which Etienne will, will talk about tomorrow, which mediates rules? So the main question which we posed last year was how do ordinary individuals become capable of undergoing such extreme change in behavior to repetitive killers in groups? I'd like to present the, uh, so this, this really has been you know, taken up by, by some, some uh, you know, after, uh, after the conference, some articles in nature, one posing this question, what makes peaceful neighbors become mass murderers? Or as nature called this, the kill switch. And 
what we want to really address in this meeting, I think, and I've posed these four questions. One, what can neuroscience tell us about the mechanisms that may underlie the transformation of seemingly normal individual to mass murderers? Two, can we find partial or parallel manifestation of the syndrome in psychopathology or sociopathology? Does a categorical diagnosis such as DSM have value, descriptive, predictive, preventive, or are alternative approaches feasible? What are the mechanisms of group contagion and propagation in the present era, in the present te technology? What is the meaning of that? <coughs> and is scientifically based intervention feasible? And we do have, I think, some speakers who can talk and who can address uh, this uh, question. So, uh, you know, with these uh, challenges, uh, I want to thank you again for coming here, for being so patient and listening to this long uh, pre -pre presentation. Thank you.